like to introduce Niklas Vogel, who is coming to us from Goethe University out of Frankfurt, Germany. Niklas will be presenting the complex reality of protecting BGP, quantifying the impact of RPKI validation in ISPs and IX and ISPs. He's a PhD student at the university and has traveled all the way from Frankfurt, Germany to be here with us in San Diego. This is Nicholas's first time presenting at NANOG, and it's a pleasure to have him here speaking with us today, and welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, right, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's also a great pleasure to see so many people talking and discussing about the RPKI. And I hope that in the next 30 minutes, I will be able to give you an additional perspective on the RPKI by talking about the deployments of RPKI validation in ISPs and IXPs, uh, ISPs. And let's start things off with a short motivation on the RPKI and BGP. So as probably all of you are aware, BGP has a problem. BGP has a hijacking problem, right? Because BGP was created in a perhaps much simpler time of the internet when security wasn't a major concern in the design of internet protocols. And so BGP builds on the inherent trust between systems, right? If in BGP a system announces to own a certain prefix, then other systems will believe this announcement and start to route traffic with a destination in this prefix to the AS that announced it. And this can of course be exploited for hijacks. And while this assumption of trust might have been valid in the beginning days of the internet, it's not so much valid today, right? Because we have thousands of systems participating in the internet, we have tens of thousands of network operators, so mistakes and attacks and problems are prone to happen. And now the RPKI was introduced to tackle this problem and to prevent hijacks in BGP. And RPKI achieves this with a set of distributed RPKI repositories that are distributed along the internet where systems can upload rower objects that are authorizations for some systems to announce certain prefixes. And then systems can use this information in the RPKI, download these RPKI objects to validate the BGP routes that they receive and to protect themselves from hijacks. And <clears throat> from, from a deployment perspective, the RPKI has two quite distinct aspects, right? On the one side, you have the publishing of RPKI objects, of ROAS, and on the other side, you have the enforcement part using these ROAS to make routing decisions. And let's start off by talking about the publication section. So let's start with an example. So if we have one AS that owns certain prefixes, in this case, three quite large prefixes, um, the AS can create these ROA objects, and in these ROA objects, the AS details um, which system is authorized to announce the prefixes that it owns. And usually systems will authorize themselves, but they can of course also authorize other systems to originate their prefixes. And then the ROAS are uploaded to an RPKI repository to make them available to other systems in the internet. And um, the next slide I will skip because we had such a great presentation at the beginning of the session that talked about how many systems have this deployed, like how many systems already create ROAS for their prefixes. So let's immediately jump to the next part, to the enforcement section. So, okay, we have these objects now in the RPKI. How do we use them as a system? And for this, a system needs to install a relying party client, an RP for short. And what the relying party does, it goes to all the RPKI repositories in the internet, it downloads all of the objects, it validates them, and then it creates a so-called VRPS file. We have also heard about this already today. And the VRPS file is simply a text file, like it's a CSV file, that just details which AS is authorized to announce which prefix according to the RPKI. And then routers can go to the RP, download this VRPS file, and then use it to make routing decisions. Now, if a router receives a BGP announcement, it can check if the prefix in the announcement is contained in this VRPS file. And if it is, it can check if the origin in the route, um, the AS number is contained in the VRPS file, and if it is, that's good, then it's an valid announcement, and if it's not, 
then it might be a hijack and so the router will usually drop the announcement. And in the context of RPKI, this concept of using the VRPS information to make routing decisions is referred to as route origin validation or ROV for short. And I mentioned this here specifically because the abbreviation ROV will be heavily used in the rest of this presentation. So it's important to understand ROV is route origin validation using RPKI information to validate the origin of a BGP route. And this raises the question, how many systems already do this, right? How many systems use the RPKI to validate BGP origins? How many systems enforce route origin validation? And there are two ongoing projects to measure this. One is by Cloudflare and one is by Upnik. And <clears throat> these projects use very different methodologies, but both of them come to the conclusion that approximately 30% of systems are protected with ROV. And there has also been scientific work on this. So two years ago, a study uh, found that only 0.6% of systems are enforcing ROV. So as you can see, there's quite a big discrepancy here, right? And the reasoning that the authors give for this discrepancy is that um, the ROV enforcement that the other projects observe is happening in IXP route servers and not in the systems itself. That's what the study suggests. suggests. And this sparked my interest, right? I wanted to find out, is that actually true? Like, are almost all of the systems just protected by a route server and don't have their own ROV deployments? So let's come to the open questions I want to answer in this talk. So first of all, I want to answer how many systems are just upstream protected. Like how many systems do not have their own enforcement, but are just using, for example, a route server, or maybe the upstream enforces ROV, and that's why they are protected. Then secondly, I want to answer, <coughs> does the, the rate of ROV enforcement differ by AS type? For example, are large providers, large ISPs, more likely to enforce ROV than, for example, small providers. Then the next open question I want to answer is, what, are the role, what is the role that IXPs play in ROV, right? Because there is this suggestion that maybe IXP route servers play a huge role in ROV, and I want to find out if that's actually true and if there's maybe some nuance there. And then lastly, I also want to quantify how big the, the impact of ROV protection already is on today's internet against prefix hijacks. And to answer these questions, we need, of course, a measurement, right? And with the measurement, a few additional questions arise. So first of all, the fundamental question is, how do we even identify if a system enforces ROV? And the idea here is quite simple. If you want to find out if a system protects itself, then you try to attack the system, right? And if the system falls victim to your attack, then you know that it's not protected. So the idea how to measure ROV is simply to announce hijacks and then check which system falls victim to our hijacks. Then the second question we want to answer is, how do we even identify upstream protection, right? Because even if we can see that a system is protected with ROV, we don't know yet if it has its own deployment or if the system is just protected by someone else. And the idea to measure this is to use paths, right? Because if we now, if we use the paths, we can see the route that a announcement takes, and then we can identify maybe a system is only, always only protected if it appears behind a ROV enforcing system, which would suggest to us that it is most likely upstream protected. And then the last question um, that arises is how do we quantify the role that IXPs play? Right? Because if we only look at BGP announcements and the AS path attribute of a BGP announcement, we can't quantify the role of IXPs because we won't see the IXPs. IXPs do not append themselves to AS paths in the BGP announcements, so if we want to see the IXPs, we have to do something different. And the approach we use for this is we use IP paths. So we send trace routes to the internet and look at these paths instead of restricting ourselves to BGP AS paths. Okay, and with this, let's come to the setup of our measurement. So in our measurement, we acquired two different ASs. In my example here, I called them O1 and O2, and both of them announce the same two prefixes all the time to the internet. And what we do then is then we send two trace routes from a start AS to both of these prefixes, and we just check where they land. And in the first example, we don't consider RPKI at all, and because we chose two prefixes which are similar, we expect that almost all of the systems in the internet will route them identically. 
because the systems will usually come to the same conclusion on the best path for both prefixes. So we will see both trace routes go to the same origin system, in this example, origin one. Okay, and now let's see how the situation changes if now RPKI comes into play. So what we did in the setup now is that we issued ROAS, but we didn't issue ROAS for all of the announcements, we just validated one announcement from each of the origins. So now in this example, we have the announcement of prefix one now validated for origin one and the announcement of prefix two validated for origin two. And this means that in this setup now, origin one is effectively trying to hijack prefix two and vice versa, O2 is trying to hijack prefix one. And now let's first look at an example where none of the systems on the path are enforcing our V. And to hopefully no one's surprise, uh, nothing changes now, right? The, the trace routes are still routed identically, and that's because the systems don't have any RV RPKI deployment, so they don't know that anything changed. They don't have any control, like they can't check the validity of the announcements. They will just route them identically as before, and now the trace routes again both land in origin one. And when measuring this, this allows us to identify that these systems do not have a comprehensive ROV deployment. Because if they would, they would have been able to identify that the announcement of prefix two from origin one is not valid according to the RPKI. It is a hijack and they would have dropped the announcement. Right, and now let's look at how the situation changes if we have AS3 now enforcing ROV. And in this example now, you can see that the, the routing of the prefixes now diverges because now AS3 is able to identify that the announcement of uh, prefix two from origin one is actually a hijack, right? It doesn't have a rower covering this prefix. And so AS3 will drop the announcement by O1 for prefix two and will instead prefer the announcement of two, O2, which it beforehand didn't prefer. And this divergence of the trace routes allows us to identify that likely on the path, some AS did enforce ROV because it actively decided to adapt this routing. And we can actually know which system on the path enforced ROV because that is the system that um, adapted its routing where the paths diverged. Because when the path di paths diverge, um, this um, gives the hint to us that the system preferred the valid announcement over the hijack in all cases, uh, indicating ROV deployment. Right. And with this measurement, we are now able to make statements about the ROV deployment in the systems. And we could make it easy for us by just saying if a system is hijacked, it doesn't have a deployment, and if it's not hijacked, it has a deployment, but there's some nuance there. So um, there are systems, of course, which don't have any deployment. But there are also systems which do have an ROV deployment, but the deployment is not comprehensive. For example, a system might still have some legacy routers which don't support RPKI, and then it will fall victim to our hijacks in some rare instances, but be protected in most cases. Or you might also have systems which generally enforce ROV, but they might not enforce it in some scenarios. For example, if their customer announces a route, they might have the incentive to still forward the route because the customer is paying them for traffic. Right, so that's the first categories. Then we also observed systems which do have a passive protection. These are systems which didn't fall victim to our hijacks at all, but the systems also didn't have any evidence for their own RPKI deployment. And this indicates to us that these systems are most likely protected by someone else, by an upstream, for example, or maybe they are protected by a route server. And the last category of systems that we observed are the systems that didn't fall victim to any hijacks and that did show clear evidence of an RPKI deployment. So these are the systems that enforce ROV. And now let's come to the exciting part. Let's talk about our results. So the bad news first, the largest group of ASs are ASs which don't have any ROV protection. These are category one in this distribution. And so a lot of systems still are not protected with RPKI. We saw a few systems in categories two and three. These are systems, these are systems which do have evidence or signs of an ROV deployment, but the deployment is not comprehensive. Then for categories four and five, these made up about 30% of all ASs that we observed. These are ASs which showed signs of being protected by someone else, for example, by a route server. So there is in fact a large percentage of systems that are protected 
not because they have their own deployment, but because they are protected by someone else. And then lastly, we saw about like 23% of systems which showed clear signs of their own ROV deployments. And then in the next step, we also classified DISs according to their type. And let's start with the tier one providers. So for the tier one providers, we see that the majority of them do in fact enforce ROV, which is good news. Um, only four of them didn't show any signs of their own ROV enforcement yet, but for them, we manually checked if they have a RPKI validator running in their system, because that would indicate to us that these systems might be working on an RPKI deployment, but just haven't activated it yet. And in fact, we observed that for all of these tier one providers that don't have an ROV enforcement yet, they have a relying party like an RPKI validator running in their system. So hopefully they are working on the deployment and might activate it in the near or distant future. Then for ISPs, the distribution is very similar to the slide beforehand. And that's because the majority of systems that we observed in our measurement were in fact ISPs. And then for, for stub ASs, the distribution changes quite a lot. And that's maybe an expected result because stub ASs usually don't have such a big focus on routing, right? They don't forward traffic for other people. And so we observed that the majority of stub ASs, if they are protected, they are upstream protected. They are protected by a route server or by a provider and they don't have <coughs> their own RV deployments. And then lastly, we also looked at IXPs. And when we applied the classification for the first time, we were actually very surprised because our classification scheme barely classified any IXP as RV enforcing. So our uh, IXPs are somewhat of a special case. Um, and to understand why this distribution looks like it does, we have to quickly talk about um, peering at the IXPs. So at the IXPs, you basically, basically have two different options for peering, right? You can either have a direct peering session or you can use the route server. And in the direct session, you just establish a, a BGP session with another system at the IXP. And for the route server, it's different. For the route server, you establish only a session with the route server and the route server then, of course, propagates your route to the other connected systems. And from an RPKI perspective, these two different options are very different because in direct peering, the IXP doesn't have any control over what is exchanged over the BGP sessions, right? The sessions are between the routers directly, between the, the systems, and the IXP doesn't have any influence on the propagated routes. Whereas in the route server, the IXP does have influence. The IXP can decide which routes it wants to uh, forward and which routes it does not want to forward. So in the route server, the IXP is able to enforce origin validation. And uh, this explains our observation, right? Because um, our classification scheme basically looked at which systems propagated routes and which didn't. And for the IXPs, you still have direct sessions. And over these direct sessions, the hijacks were, were able to spread over the IXP. And so a lot of hijacks still traverse the IXP, even though the IXPs do have, like a lot of them have a ROV deployment in their route servers. And this of course raises the question, well, how prevalent are the direct sessions still? And there are probably people here in the room that can answer this better than I can, but we tried to quantify this with an approximation. So we can't directly measure how people are peering, right? We don't know if they are peering over the route server versus a direct session. But we are able to make the approximation because we checked for the large IXPs if they do in fact enforce our V in their route servers. And all of them do. And so we were like, we could check if a announcement of us was a hijack and propagated over the IXP in a session, then we knew this session could have been over the route server. Because if, if it was a route server session, the route server would have dropped our hijack, right? And we observed when we, when we did the classification um, that for almost all of the large ISPs, the majority of peerings that we observed were in fact not propagating hijacks. So these are potentially route server peerings. But uh, when we looked at the amount of paths, we actually saw that for uh, all the large IXPs, more than half of the paths didn't use these peerings, didn't use these potential route server peerings. A lot of the paths went over the direct peerings, and so our hijacks were able to spread um, over the IXP 
um, routing space. Great. And this raises the question for us, okay, then how big is the impact that IXP route servers have on the spread of hijacks? And generally, how big is the impact that the ROV enforcement today in systems has on, <clears throat> on the spread of hijacks? And to quantify this, we used the internet graph that we observed in our trace routes and the information uh, about our reinforcement and systems that we got through our classification scheme. And, right, and so we created three different graphs. And the first graph is just the normal internet graph without any modifications by us. Then the second graph is the same graph, but we removed all edges which we identified as ROV enforcing. So if a system, for example, enforces ROV, we just removed all edges from and to the system. And the idea of this graph is to quantify how, how a graph would look like for hijacks. Like, a, of course, hijacks can't spread over edges which are ROV enforcing. And so graph two models the graph available to prefix hijacks. And then graph three, the last graph, is a graph where we just removed the edges over the routes over the IXPs that we suspected to run over the route servers to quantify how big the impact of the route of the route servers are um, in preventing the spread of prefix hijacks. And for time's sake, I want to uh, only look at two different graph metrics here. And the first metric I want to look at is the graph connectivity. So, how much does the graph connectivity reduce for hijacks? And in fact, we observed that the connectivity is already significantly reduced for hijacks, both by generally our reinforcement in all systems, and also um, it is significantly reduced for hijacks when only considering uh, route server enforcement. And that's good news, right? If the connectivity goes down for hijacks, hijacks have a much harder time to spread through the internet today than they would have without any ROV deployment. And then the second metric I want to look at is the average longest path length. So basically, how many hops at a maximum could a hijack spread through the internet? And the promising result is that this average longest path length is also already significantly reduced with ROV deployments today. So um, on average, the hijacks today can not only have less connectivity available to them, they also can't spread as far. And that can be mainly attributed to the ROV enforcements in the tier one providers, because the tier one providers provide like global connectivity, right? And if they enforce ROV, then hijacks can't spread that far. And interestingly, the same does not hold true for the ROV enforcement in route servers. And this might be surprising at first, but if you think about it, that actually makes sense because the route server are great at providing a localized protection to the systems that use it, right? The hijacks are not able to spread to these systems, but because of the direct sessions, the hijacks are usually able to still spread over the IXP routing space and reach wider parts of the internet. And so the IXPs provide a localized protection, but they have a hard time protecting wider parts of the internet in regards of how far, like how many hops at a maximum the hijacks can spread. And with this, let's come to, let's come to a few takeaways from uh, our measurement. So the first takeaway and the most important one is that ROV is great because it not only protects you, it also protects the systems you are connected to, right? Because if you have your ROV deployed, then you will drop hijacks and the hijacks won't be able to spread further and other systems which maybe even don't have their own deployment are still protected by your ROV. Then the second takeaway is that even when you don't have your own ROV deployment, you can still be protected if you start moving sessions to the route server because then the route server does the filtering for you and the attack is not able to spread to your system even if you don't have your own ROV deployment. So moving sessions to the route server, if that's possible, helps to protect you from prefix hijacks if the route server is enforcing ROV, of course. And then the last takeaway is that even if you don't want to think about ROV at all, you can still benefit from the RPKI, right? Because as I mentioned earlier, the deployment of RPKI has two quite distinct parts. There's the publishing of, ob publishing of objects and there's the ROV deployment. And even if you don't have an ROV deployment, you can create ROAS, you can upload the ROAS to the RPKI, and then other systems will use these ROAS to enforce ROV and thereby protect your resources. So 
even if you don't want to consider um, think about uh, RV, you can still create rowers to benefit from the RPKI. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, then feel free to ask here. Or if you any, have any questions later, then feel free to write me an email. And this talk was based on a paper that we published at Youth Security this year. So if you want to read more about it, then feel free to look at the paper. Thank you. Uh, hi. hi, Gordon Gidolfabe from Think Fiber. I was wondering, how did you achieve such a diversity in parts when you advertised these two probe routes? I did a very similar topic back in 2020 for a master's thesis, and my main uh, difficulty in measurements were that I could not get my route advertisements enough in on enough uh, uh, diverse parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So. Um, we just like we rented a few VMs from uh, providers to make the announcements globally distributed. So we had one one uh, announcement from Nigeria, I think, one from Brazil, one in the US, and one in Japan. And this allowed our routes to be already quite uh, separated. And um, we actually, when we when we made the setup at the first time, we had the problem that. Um, the, a lot of providers are already filtering ROV, right? So if you make the hijacks at a wrong location in the internet, then they will be immediately filtered and you can't see anything, right? But with, with like renting these, these uh, points of presence, basically, we were able to get a, a large like, coverage of the announcement. And then we used Ripe Atlas for the trace routes, which also gave us like, quite a, a big um, coverage of of locations and routes, and this was how we was we were able to measure so many ASs. Thank you very much, and congrats on the paper. Thank you. Okay, it seems like there aren't any questions. Then thank you. Goodbye.